when Stanley and I first got together and decided that we were going to make films together, uh, I had never produced a film before, but he had directed a couple of feature films, little ones, but, and some short subjects. But he felt that, that he needed uh, someone that could run interference for him. In other words, give him the freedom to be able to not worry about where the money is coming from and, and, and what are all these production problems. So if I could solve those problems and give him the, 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 uh, uh, the open road, so to speak, to concentrate strictly on, on the artistic aspects of it, uh, we'd make a good partnership. Pairs of Glory actually was an independent picture. The way it worked was that in, in, in the early days, studios had a lot of actors under contract. They acquired the rights to stories. They decided that they wanted to, to do that particular picture. They org the studio organized the whole deal. Uh, an independent picture is where a producer gets a, a, an idea to do a film. He acquires the film rights to a book, let's say, and he develops the screenplay, and he casts it, and then he takes it to a distributor, uh, which, is, which is, in most cases, a major company. And so uh, Pairs of Glory is a pure independent in that it was all developed outside of United Artists and taken to United Artists in a package form. And they then put up the money to make the film. The whole idea of Pairs of Glory started with, with a desire on the part of, of Kubrick and myself to do a war film. Uh, which later turned out to be an anti-war film. And uh, uh, we then uh, diligently looked for material in order to satisfy this, this desire. And I happened to be in New York on some business, and, and Stanley called me from, from California saying that he had just remembered at the age of 14 or so, he had read a book called Paths of Glory by Humphrey Cobb. And I read it, and, and uh, got back to Stanley and said, yeah, you're right, this, this, this is it. This, this could be uh, something that, that we both feel strongly about. Uh, so the, my job was then to acquire the film rights, uh, which, which I was able to do for $10,000. And uh, we were in business. We had just done a, a picture called The Killing, which was going to be released by United Artists. And, uh, the picture had, had, had caused a stir in Hollywood. You know, these two young kids had done this film, uh, which turned out to, to get good reviews. And, and so we had worked with Jim Thompson on The Killing, who was, who was a, a great crime writer at that time. And we put him to work on starting to, to do the screenplay of Paths of Glory. Jim Thompson had, had, had uh, completed whatever work he was going to do on it. And, and, and so we. Uh, brought Calder Willingham with us to uh, continue working on Pairs of Glory. So you'll notice that the, the uh, screenplay had three credits. I think uh, Kubrick, Calder Willingham, and Jim Thompson. And that's, that's basically uh, how the screenplay was, uh, was completed. Our first object, actually, was to, to cast the, the main character. And our first choice was Kirk Douglas. Uh, when we went to Kirk Douglas, uh, he, he read the script and, and uh, told us how much he liked the script and would like to do the film. However, he was committed to do a stage play in New York, and uh, he wasn't available, uh, which, which was a big setback for us. Sometimes luck has a lot to do with, with your success, because it turned out that Kirk Douglas uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but whatever the situation was in New York, it, it deteriorated, and, and Kirk was, was available once more. Uh, when we got this news, we, we really were back in business. Kirk was a, a, a tough taskmaster, and he had an agent at that time, a man named Ray Stark, who was determined to, to, to sort of make like a, a, you might say, a lifelong deal with Harrison Kubrick to make movies for Kirk's company, which was called Bryna at the time. And so we had to enter into a, into a deal to uh, do five films for Bryna. Kirk Douglas would be in two of those films, one being Pairs of Glory, and then uh, that would tie us up for, you know, maybe eight years or seven years. You, you, at your best, you could do one film a, a year or a year and a half. Uh, but we were desperate to, to get Pairs of Glory made, and if that was the deal, we had to go with it. And so uh, we entered into that contract, and, and uh, now we had a major star attached to the, to the project. Uh, 
Now the casting uh, uh, was was uh, easy at that point because we no longer had to worry about getting a major star in order to, to get the financing. We had Kirk Douglas. So now it was just a question of getting the best people for each role. And, and I think Kubrick is a master at doing that. We're dealing with a story that, that is of the French army in, in the First World War. And we're casting all Americans to play the, uh, the different parts of the French army. Uh, I think in Hollywood, their instincts would be to play everyone with French accents in order to sell the fact that they are French. Uh, we felt that, 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 that this wasn't the way we saw the, the film, that, that people, when they see the film, would be like reading a book. When you read a book that's been written in the French language, it's translated into English, and you're reading it in English. Uh, it would be the same thing here, is that, that you know, we're translating a story that took place in France into English. So I would say that from the very beginning, our concept was to just play it straight, just play it as they speak. And, and uh, the, the people we feel have enough intelligence that are watching the movie that, that can make the transition for that these are French soldiers. Will we, sir? I'm depending on you, Colonel. All France is depending on you. Am I amusing you, Colonel? Not a bull, General. I don't need a flag waved in front of me to get me to charge. I don't think I like a comparison of the flag of France to a bullfighter's cape. I mean, nothing disrespectful to the flag of France. Patriot. We were criticized, actually. I think Bosley Crowther, the dean of the, of the critics and, and at that time in the New York Times, um, I think took odds uh, with this. He, he, he may have thrown him off or something. But we couldn't imagine Kirk Douglas speaking with a French accent or any of these people. It, it, just, it just didn't seem right. Stanley always conferred, uh, always counseled with me on, on every thought that he had. You know, we had a partnership with, which we, we agreed from the very beginning that we would, we would always agree. And if we disagreed, we, would, we, we felt we were both intelligent enough to be able to put forth an argument that one should be able to convince the other. Uh, that, that we should never have to, to uh, be in a position where we couldn't resolve a uh, difference of opinion. Um, Stanley's opinion usually proved right, though. I mean, he usually convinced me, because uh, he was very good at, at putting forth these uh, the sound arguments. You know, he, he, he didn't, he didn't uh, operate emotionally. He did everything uh, on the basis of it making sense and being able to support uh, what he believed in. That's why he got such great performances and great respect all through his, his, his uh, body of work from the actors is because he never asked them to do anything that he couldn't uh, substantiate with, with, with sound reasoning. So when we started making movies, Stanley always said, pull up a chair, you know, and I sat next to him when he was directing. I sat next to him in the editing room. As we went along, uh, I started to be making more and more of a contribution into, into the films, which Stanley uh, uh, encouraged. Stanley gave me a camera and put me out in the battlefield to shoot some shots of when the battle was taking place. It was never the fact about, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're starting to interfere with my work. It was always, give me more, give me more. But we had no, no pride of authorship. That was the big thing that made it work so well for us, is that Stanley was not protective about me being next to him. He, he wasn't like, a lot of directors would not like the producer on the set. They would not like the producer around, if nothing else, to, to not let the 60-man crew think that he's getting any ideas from anybody else. Stanley w was not at all worried about things like that. I mean, he had such confidence in himself that he didn't think that, that, that it was undermining his, his uh, uh, image to, to anybody around, that he was uh, sharing ideas with, with his producer. Uh, that's what I loved about Stanley, that, that, that he was not selfish and, and he was not uh, out to, to, to try to, to grab all the glory himself. He was, he was only too willing to share everything. Some people think his earlier films are, are, are among his best. Maybe it was because, you know, he had to, to get it right the first time and get it right, and he could. He, he was totally capable of, of working with the conditions that he was given. 
if it didn't work right, it wasn't because of, of Stanley being a little nuts, you know, about, de about you know, minuscule nuances that nobody in the world would notice except himself. It was because somebody blew a line, somebody didn't, didn't hit their mark, somebody got in somebody else's light, uh, one of the props didn't work. The stories that, that eventually started to, to pop up here and there about his take after take after take and, and uh, his, his uh, maniacal uh, uh, approach to, to getting exactly what he wanted. Uh, I didn't see that coming. To me, I, I just saw a man who took into consideration what, what the facts were in terms of his budget, his schedule, and uh, what the script called for. And uh, he went and did it. And he did it in the time that, that he had to do it in, and, and uh, he didn't ask for more. What he did show from the very beginning was a complete concern about everything. If, for instance, he would insist that I, that I carry a notebook, you know, a little pad, and write everything down. He says, you, you, nobody can remember everything. And uh, he was right. And, you know, he, it's, I, I remember, like, he'd, he'd have his, his pad with all the things, and he, like some, someone that's, that, that was maybe working in the lab or something that, that he had asked to do something would come walking down the hall, and Stanley would see him, and right away go to his pad, and when that person would see that, he would, he would want to turn around and, and run for it, you know, because he knew Stanley was going to be on his case. Uh, he had this, this uh, concern about everything, you know, and, and I guess, you know, the, the, uh, the business about what could go wrong will go wrong. I mean, Stanley really believed that if you, if you didn't watch everything, uh, it, it could go wrong. And, and he explained it to me this way, because I had a tendency to, 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 to worry about people, their feelings. And Stanley would always say, listen, our names are going to be on this film forever. We are never going to see these people that we're working with again. So if you want to run the risk of having something affect that film, which your name is going to be on for the rest of your life, because you're worried about hurting the feelings of that person, you're in the wrong business. And he was absolutely right. And, and it's not being cruel. It's just being that when you make a film, you get one shot at it, and you can't go back. And if you have somebody that is not trustworthy, evidenced by the fact that they have failed you in some capacity before, Stanley would say, you just have to get rid of them. You have to replace them. Like, for instance, Tim Carey. Was it was a problem. I had to work with Tim Carey on, I'd take him outside and walk him around, and you know to get his posture right because he's supposed to be a soldier. You know, Tim Carey is is an incredible presence on the screen. Uh, no matter what he does to get there in terms of giving you problems and shooting him, when you have the final result on the screen, he's very effective, as he was in The Killing and as he was in Pairs of Glory, but. He was nothing but trouble getting there. Tim Carey was a, was, was a, a real scene stealer, and, and he always tried to do something that, that would attract people's attention on the screen, uh, which, of course, is, is, is at cross purposes with what Stanley is doing. For instance, there was a scene in the, in the court martial where the three uh, defendants were sitting in chairs while Kirk Douglas was making the, the speech for, for the defense, and uh, Tim Carey was... was leaning back on his chair, which, which is outrageous. And the, the worst happened, of course, is that, she, that he went over the back of his chair in the middle of Kirk Douglas' monologue. And uh, I, I, I was just worried that, that Kirk was going to kill him, you know, for doing this. We did the scene in, in Pairs of Glory where, where the, it was the, the day, night before they're executed, and they have that last meal, and they bring in the duck. And mostly Tim Carey would, 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 would improvise certain things that were not known before the scene started. And, and, and he would shock everybody by doing this or doing that. And uh, he, he just likes to steal scenes. And he was responsible for a lot of, of, of having to do it over and over again. We were running out of ducks, you know, because once, once the duck comes in and they start tearing it apart, you need another duck if you're going to do it again. It took 57 times, and we got it, finally got it right. This duck is terrific. You suppose they put these things in the food? First they poison us, then they shoot us. 
Why did they put something in it? Like what? Like, uh, like something to make us groggy or something. What would be wrong with that if they did? Maybe not for you, but I'm going to get out of this somehow. And I don't want to be drugged. One morning, at maybe 5, 6 in the morning, I was awakened in the hotel by the police, who told me that they have an actor in Paz of Glory that they're holding who claims to have been kidnapped. And they found him bound hand and foot on a highway somewhere, claiming that he had been kidnapped and held for ransom uh, to the film production. And they needed the producer to confirm that this was, in fact, Tim Carey, and in fact, that, that uh, uh, it was not a stunt on the part of the film company in order to get publicity. Uh, I was totally shocked and surprised about, about this event. And, 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 and I believe that Tim Carey had staged this himself to get personal publicity, uh, which, which now was backfiring because they were holding him and we had to be shooting uh, that day. Uh, with Tim Carey in the scenes. And Tim w w was not cooperating with the police on the questioning and signing the statement. And they would type it up and bring it to him, and he, and he, would, he would say it has to be changed to this. And it was going on and on. And, and I felt we were losing it. We were losing control out on the set that, that the actors were going to start to, to go home or, or do something. I mean, you're dealing with, with major actors. I mean, Kirk Douglas is a major star. You can't have him sitting around waiting for, for Tim Carey to sign a statement. And I told Tim that if he doesn't sign the statement, that, that I'm going to have to fire him on the film. Uh, I can't let him hold me hostage. Uh, and, and Tim wouldn't cooperate, and I had to fire him. And I told Stanley that, and Stanley accepted it, because Stanley knew that the film would, would, would really be uh, in real trouble if, if this kept up. So I had to let him go. That meant that we had to double him uh, particularly in, in the scene uh, where the chaplain comes in to give them the last rites, so to speak. Before, uh, the, that's a double. Uh, you, you see Tim Carey from the back. And, and, and also, uh, the, the last uh, uh, sequences on the schedule were the, was the battle scenes. And uh, they were yet to be shot because we, were, we, had to, we had to build the battlefields from farmlands and so forth, and that was under construction. And we wouldn't get to it for another few weeks. Uh, so we had to decide that, that uh, you can't show the, the three men who are eventually uh, uh, convicted of cowardice uh, in the battles because Tim's gone. He's, he's no longer around, so you can't show two of the three because it, it would be begging for an explanation of what happened to, what happened to the, third, uh, the third soldier. Uh, maybe it's just as well. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise because then you'd have to demonstrate that they, that they weren't cowards. You want a blindfold? In this particular case, um, we knew going in that there was something different about the picture in that it's not going to turn out to be uh, the happy ending kind of a movie. In order to make your point, that war is hell and that war shouldn't happen and that terrible things happen in wars uh, that can't be avoided. Uh, you had to, to execute men, which, which is, which is going to be uh, horrible for an audience to have to witness this. Uh, and it was discussed before the film was even made. In fact, I think, I think the, the, the screenplay that was presented to United Artists for, for financing had the men saved in the end because we figured that would be the best way for them to finance the film. They may have turned it down if it, was, if it had a downbeat ending. Uh, it was only after we got started that we realized that the only way it could work would be to execute the men. And then I somehow had to let United Artists know that there's, there's a major change in, in, the, in, the, in the script. And so what I decided is, is I wouldn't send them the specific pages. I would send them the entire script with the new, with the new pages in the script because I know they're too busy to read. The, the executives there, they, they, you know, the picture's already being made. Why, why read the script? And I just sent a self-serving letter saying, herewith enclosed the final draft of, of uh, Paths of Glory. Uh, best regards. Uh, I know they weren't going to read it, but I always worried about what were they going to think when they, when they see the picture. Ready? It, 
anyway, when they saw the film, they, they thought it was very good. And, and it wasn't a word said one way or the other. I just wanted to do anything I could to make the picture successful and, and to give Stanley the, the opportunity to, to do his thing. I was able to get the financing for the picture. I was able to, to solve all the production problems, to work with the budget and the schedule, uh, to keep everybody in line so Stanley didn't have to worry about that. But that's what a producer should do. I don't have to get any special credit for that. I mean, that's what a producer does. That's what you get paid for. If, if you can't do your job, you shouldn't be doing it.